Self-criticism. Is your inner critic torturing you? So many of us, so many people have this constant stream of self-critical thought that really makes our lives miserable. So if you've been trying to stop this inner critic, but really having difficulty doing that, I'm going to give you a totally different approach. Rather than stop the inner critic, we're going to give the inner critic different language, and we are going to understand what the real purpose of the inner critic is, which will, over time, stop the abuse. And if you're at the beginning of your journey trying to be nicer to yourself, listen in for some tools you can implement and practice. So the first step is to recognize what is destructive about the way your inner critic speaks to you. Because instead of stopping the inner critic, we're going to give the inner critic different language to use. So I just did a series of videos on destructive versus constructive criticism. And if you're watching this video, my guess is that your inner critic uses primarily destructive criticism. If your inner critic actually gives you a critique, which would be sort of an analysis of what went right, what went wrong, what you might try next time, where you might want to put in a little more effort. Well, then you probably aren't watching this video. But if you are, good for you. That's the voice we want to develop. So destructive criticism, whether it's internal or to somebody else, uses a lot of you statements and labeling. You are a slob. You are worthless. You don't know how to do this at all. You fail at everything. It's actually a condemnation. It's certainly not a critique. It's not an analysis of the problem. So when your inner critic jumps in with something destructive like you are a slob, ask it. Talk to yourself. We're going to talk about why talking to yourself is not just okay, but helpful. Ask the critic, can you rephrase that? I'm hearing that you are feeling like you're a slob. So I know you're upset that I just spilt the entire pot of chili on myself and you want me to be more careful next time, right? So I know this isn't going to be easy, but if you can keep in mind what the components of constructive criticism are, mainly specific, actionable, and a shared agenda, and stay away from the language of the destructive condemnation, or at least introduce those concepts into that inner dialogue, it's really going to help in the long run. And then also, like all the tips and concepts I'm talking about today, they work together. So it's not like this one has to be accomplished before you move on. It's all going to be a process. So step number two is to recognize that your self-criticism at this point, these are automatic thoughts. We all have automatic thoughts. We have a gazillion thoughts a day, and I'd say most of them are automatic. They just happen. We don't have to take them all seriously. Automatic thoughts are usually repetitive, and they feel like they're true, but that doesn't mean they're true. Beginning to look at your thoughts instead of letting them totally consume you and overwhelm you, looking at them, develop some space. It develops a space where you can see the thought and analyze it, but not have to be totally in it. So when your inner critic jumps in with some destructive criticism, you can say, that's an automatic thought. Label it. Labeling the thought really, really helps us create distance. So the next two steps to this process are going to really help both with the rephrasing of the criticism and with the recognizing it as an automatic thought and knowing you don't have to believe it. And one of those steps is recognizing where this voice came from and why it developed. And then also developing self-compassion, which I know right now might seem totally impossible, but bear with me. So step three, recognizing where this voice came from. So for most people, the self-criticism and the inner critic come from an internalized voice of a parental figure or caretaker or someone very important in your life when you were a child. Now, many, many people can recognize right away, oh yeah, that's the way my dad used to talk to me and that's the voice I've internalized. Other clients of mine, as most of you know, I was a psychotherapist for 20 years helping people 
with these issues of these automatic thoughts, anxieties, self-criticisms. But if people didn't recognize that voice as, you know, who it came from right away, they might say, no, nobody ever talked to me that way, but I know that my mother felt that way or my father felt that way. That's how my mother or father would talk to themselves. So sometimes children can absorb this stuff by osmosis. And I'd say the third category where I've really seen this voice develop from if that sentence made sense, but would be bullying. So for people who were bullied in grade school, they very often develop this internalized voice. And this internalized voice is basically repeating to yourself what the bully said or what the abuser in your life said. Because here's the sad thing for children who grow up with abusive parents is that children believe what their parents say. So even though you probably hit an age, a certain point in your life where you knew it wasn't true any longer, when we are young, we really, really absorb what we are told about ourselves. A child's identity develops because of the people around them and the way that they are responded to. And early in life, it's the primary caregivers And then school becomes an influence, of course, teachers, other children, possible bullies. But our self-concept develops in terms of how people relate to us. And unfortunately, if we have a parent who was damaged very young themselves, and they treat us as if we are damaged, we develop a self-concept that we are damaged. But in fact, We were being treated as if we were damaged because the other person was damaged. So this takes a lot of healing, but a good first step is to begin to see that internalized voice differently and know that even if you can really identify where that voice came from, it's not your dad's voice. It's not your mom's voice. It's your voice internalized that reflects their voice. So it is separate. It's separate from their voice. It's yours and you can change it. So that's just an important piece because I've had clients who've been like, oh, well, that's my mom's voice. It's never going to go away. No, it's actually not your mom's voice. It's your internalized version of your mom's voice. And then the other thing to recognize about this internalized voice is that it's actually trying to protect you. Now, I know that probably sounds totally nuts, but if you really think it through, that voice is trying to protect you so you can stay connected to your caregivers or to other people. So let me give you an example. Let's say you were bullied as a kid. Let's say you were a boy and one day, second grade, you began to cry about something. And the other kids just jumped in and jumped on you, cry baby, cry baby, and then never let it go. That whole year you were called cry baby. Well, you're gonna develop an internalized voice that says, don't cry, don't cry. And every time you feel like crying, your internalized voice is gonna say to you, you're a crybaby, stop crying, you're weak, you're useless, you're, you know, we'll go on a rant. Why? Because it doesn't want that to happen to you again. So it doesn't want you to cry because it doesn't want other people to pick on you because it wants you to be able to be comfortable in the classroom around other kids. All right, that's sort of a simplified example, but probably with a little bit of investigation, you'll be able to figure out what that internalized voice developed or what reason it developed, what it was trying to protect you from, and it still, in its own way, is trying to protect you now, even though it's torturing you, okay? So another example would be, let's say you had a mom who anytime you did something selfish or anytime she wanted to disappear or she wanted to retreat, she would tell you you did something selfish or she would call you selfish. Then she'd go into her bedroom, slam the door, leave you alone for hours. Well, your internalized voice is going to develop telling yourself that you're selfish, don't be selfish, that was selfish, you're a horrible selfish person, because one, it believes the parent, and two, it doesn't want mom running into the bedroom. That part of you doesn't want to be abandoned. Now, let me know if this makes sense to you. You can put a comment below. And I really want to encourage you to open your mind to this concept. And you may already have this concept, but if you don't, open your mind to the concept that our early experiences kind of live in us almost forever throughout our lives until we do some work and some healing around them and separate from some of the 
automatic patterns that have developed. So the next step, that's the developing some self-compassion for yourself, both for this inner critic, some self-compassion for the inner critic part of yourself that was trying to protect you, and self-compassion for the parts of yourself that you feel aren't worthy, and compassion for yourself for what you went through. And that definitely takes time, but even there, just opening to the concept that it's possible to develop self-compassion for yourself, and that understanding some of these patterns, why they developed, can really help with that self-compassion. And then bringing a little more self-compassion into the voice where you speak to yourself, into that voice with which you speak to yourself. So last step here, which kind of wraps this all up, is to develop an inner coach, an inner positive coach, or an inner positive parent. And you might have had one. You might have had a parent who was encouraging and helpful. You might have had a grandparent, a teacher. There may have been someone in your life who really encouraged you in a healthy, helpful way. So bringing their voice into your head more so that when that inner critic is destructive and nasty, you can bring in that other voice. And if you didn't have someone in your life like that, you can pull someone from a TV show. Wow, wish I had a mom like that. Wow, wish I had a coach that helped me in that way. You can bring that voice in from somebody in the movies. And then also with therapy, very, very often people internalize the compassionate, kind voice of their therapist. But this is work. It takes practice. And I'm actually about to launch a live program for the first time in, I don't know, almost two years that will focus on helping to transform negative core beliefs. And these negative core beliefs are the ones that developed in childhood that our inner critic uses, the ones we criticize ourselves about, the ones we torture ourselves with. And I have a free PDF, Transform Your Negative Core Beliefs. If you download it, you will be on my mailing list and you will be the first to be notified when I launch this new program. And if you're watching this after it's already been launched, there's other resources and programs on my website. So know this is possible. Know you can transform or let's say transmute this inner critic. You can help move this inner critic to an encouraging, kind, helpful coach or parent, but a voice that will sustain you and support you rather than drag you down. All right. Let me know what you think. I look forward to reading your comments, and I will see you next week.